Why don't we get going? Are you ready? I'm ready whenever yes. you are. Yes. Okay. Well, welcome everybody who's made it. And for those of you who watch this as a recording later, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to be here. I'm Zaina Griffoni. Today I'm introducing uh, somebody I've known. My, I could actually say I've known him my entire life <laughs> because he's my brother, um, Dr. Ramsey Asfor. Um, and I cannot tell you how excited and proud I am to be able to bring him into this group. Um, he's a fantastic physician. Um, I'll let you, t I'll let him tell you a little bit more about his background, but he's been just a gem in terms of helping us navigate through COVID for the studio, for our clients, for our personal lives, um, as well as that is definitely not the only thing he does. He's also a functional medicine specialist. So he's helped a lot of people, a lot of clients, a lot of people that I know um, and including his entire family through uh, a lot of issues um, as well on that level. So I will let him introduce himself a little bit to you and we'll start from there. All right. Hi, hi everybody. So I'm uh, Dr. Ramsey Ashford. So as Dana said, I do, I'm an infectious disease specialist. I've been working actually consulting for nursing homes and businesses and schools and infection uh, prevention and uh, uh, working in hospitals and also doing functional medicine. Uh, so I have a different lens than a lot of conventional uh, physicians, especially when it comes to things like long COVID, uh, which is today's topic. So I'll start by giving a little bit of a background uh, and then really we want to make this interactive and uh, uh, just uh, to, to make it more interesting and really more pertinent to what you guys are seeing. And I think Zaina has a long list of questions also, which we can uh, go through. Can't say that I have all the answers, but I'll do my best. I always like to start with just a bit of background. And uh, I've been showing this Johns Hopkins dashboard since the beginning of the pandemic. I've done uh, countless webinars. And it's awesome now to see more than 6 billion doses of vaccine administered. So it's huge uh, worldwide. We have a lot of experience. Uh, I, I, you know, hard to imagine there's still a, a debate about vaccination and, and not, but in one of the hospitals, I the I infectious disease doctor for in Lake County. Uh, so it's a rural red, if you will, county in uh, California that, uh, you know, low vaccination rates. So there, as opposed to the Bay Area, we're seeing a lot of uh, COVID patients. Uh, you know, we had we have a husband and wife in the ICU. Uh, the woman had a blood clotting complication and was helicoptered off to Stanford last night. And uh, you know, that's there. It, it's unnecessary. They're, you know, the people that are in the ICU are you know, ninety nine percent of them are unvaccinated. So uh, it's uh, just the, not, but I used to work at the World Health Organization as well. So you know, I have to put on my public health hat. We always have to think of ourselves and our neighbors and uh, you know, who we're protecting in our decisions to vaccinate. So, uh, but we still have, you know, this is worldwide where, you know, sort of the tail end of a third wave. Uh, if you look at United States data, uh, just to show you guys this website, uh, quickly, I mean, you can see the, the U.S. data here is uh, uh, pretty interesting as well. I mean, we can see the curve in a second. It takes a while for, the, for it to load on, on their end. But you can see L.A. County uh, has the highest number of deaths, remembering that New York is always five counties, right? Kings, Queens, Kings, Manhattan, uh, Bronx, uh, and uh, Staten Island. Um, and Brooklyn. So we have, uh, you know, uh, the red areas are higher activity in the in the U.S. And, and you can see what's going on there. And then we have this really cool 90 second little video that I, I like to play.
as you can see, there's a lot uh, going on worldwide still in some areas. The UK is interesting because uh, they just said that masking is no longer necessary in schools. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, states that are not masking and not highly vaccinated still have high rates here. Texas going to Florida, which uh, is uh, quite a bit different. You can see that, uh, and this is the University of Washington data, it started to finally level up. And uh, you can see the daily deaths which finally leveled up in Florida, hospital resource use, daily infections, all, all the numbers are going down. California is doing quite a bit better overall. Uh, remember that we do have quite a few areas like Lake County where it's going up, we're, we're kind of flat here in, in deaths and uh, daily deaths have spiked a little bit and are now decreasing again. So we're really well out of, we're on the way out of the, the fourth wave. So this is uh, COVID by uh, world. And then if you go to the US, you can see on this worldometer website, you can see the nice waves. So you know, sort of uh, first wave, uh, second wave, third wave, which was big, right? That was around Christmas time last year. And then uh, the fourth wave. And just looking at uh, Florida on that graph is very telling about vaccinations. You know, their fourth wave uh, was, was super high, right? You saw that our fourth wave or our third wave was high. Theirs was high too, but their fourth wave was even higher than their third wave. And in California, ours was much lower. So that's because we have uh, much more vaccination and much more masking. So indoor masking uh, is uh, definitely important. Um, we're here to talk about long-term COVID, and there's a lot of uh, you know, side, you know, we, you guys have probably all heard lots of symptoms. Uh, COVID can cause organ damage. I've seen in, in the functional medicine sphere, I've seen uh, a lot of patients with post-COVID syndrome that have fatigue, and some of them could be uh, college kids or, or high school kids with uh, that, that are just can't do exams. They can't they can't remember their memories in there, uh, which uh, you know just sitting for exams is super challenging for a few kids that I've seen with post COVID syndrome. So it's a recognized syndrome now, and uh, I'll talk about what I think is going on in a minute, but just give you a few more, uh, a little bit more background, just to show you, you know, these are some of the uh, effects, you know, reduced exercise tolerance. Uh, uh, this is smell or taste uh, dysfunction. That usually improves shortness of breath, concentration. Concentration deficits in a quarter of people with long COVID. Uh, so, you know, and it goes all the way down. I'm not gonna read them all. Uh, you know, of the patients that have COVID-19, approximately 88% or 87.4% had one or more persistent symptom. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really uh, a, a problem. And so we're really, we're seeing this. It, it, it causes lung damage and organ damage. It's a virus that, it, that really affects and infects the whole body. So we see not just cough and pneumonia, which are the most worrisome signs, but in people who are more severely ill, we will see uh, liver manifestations, gut manifestations, kidney manifestations. And in the long run, there's been lots of data on uh, you know, people's kidney function isn't quite the same afterwards. Their liver function isn't the same, and of course, their lung function isn't the same. And uh, this is another list of acute complications versus post-COVID syndrome. So a lot of neuropsych manifestations, respiratory, and we're talking physical therapy, movement, uh, musculoskeletal, muscle wasting, weakness, deconditioning, uh, all, all problems that you may be seeing. And the respiratory problems would also be pertinent uh, in, in your work because of the uh, you know, basic inability to exercise or move as well as, as possible, uh, or as well as before. So 
uh, you know, many, many studies, 30, uh, two to three weeks, 35% did not return to the usual state of health. And uh, among young adults with no chronic medical conditions, one fifth had not returned to the usual state of health. So uh, it's, it's definitely uh, a concern. Long COVID concerns help fuel Biden administration's broad vaccine booster push. We've all heard about the booster. Uh, and the, it, it is true that the vaccine protects against long COVID. And uh, so there's been ample data now showing that, and we don't know how necessary a booster is for protecting against long COVID, but I'm going to get my booster soon. Uh, first vaccinated in the, uh, in actually, in first dose was in December. So, um, and uh, uh, on well, yesterday, uh, WHO uh, formally announced, uh, you know, conditions for long COVID. They have a five-minute video. They have lots of updates. Uh, so Johns Hopkins and WHO are two good places to go for general updates on, um, on COVID. So that's a little bit of background. Uh, and I thought that we'd open it up to discussions or the grilling session by Zena. <laughs> I always like to start grilling because that opens the door. But uh, go ahead, I'll let you guys, uh, Melinda, go ahead and ask a question. Yeah, I mean, it's correct. I've seen uh, a lot of my friends, some of my clients that are left in wheelchairs after having COVID um, and that are left with other inflammatory illnesses that have actually gone on to kill them after the fact. Um, brain dead, brain Brain, one of them, one of my neighbors was left brain dead, but he was COVID free. So they let him out and to die in his home with his family, but it left him in a terrible way. Um, but there are, you know, like I said, some of my clients have been left um, with a lot of limited mobility, you know, like if they had a stroke, it was as if they had a stroke. So they have to learn their movement patterns again. Yes, yes, I mean, COVID does cause blood clotting. So uh, people who get admitted to the hospital, we give them blood thinners because it does cause you to have blood clotting. So stroke is something that we might expect to see and uh, with, with COVID, that's definitely a concern. Uh, uh, somebody asked, this is for hospitalized patients or who had mild symptoms and long COVID, uh, does not correlate to how sick you were. You could have no symptoms, and uh, and and then uh, have long COVID, and that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing more of because most people don't end up in the hospital. Uh, but uh, definitely seeing a lot of people with uh, with mild symptoms who, when they get COVID, they end up with long COVID. They, we, we don't really understand enough about who's at risk to develop it, but it does not correlate to the severity of your symptoms, at least not, not clearly. Yeah. All right, so I'll, I'll set in, oh, Kim, go ahead. Um, does long COVID, do you, do you see it in people who have contracted COVID but have been vaccinated? Uh, you see it in uh, no, no, I have not. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure my story. question. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, no. If you're if, yeah. if you're vaccinated, okay. if you're vaccinated, you have a massive degree of protection against long COVID. I mean, some people don't have the take, but uh, remember that. At least before Delta, the vaccines were 93 to 94 percent effective in preventing infection. But we do know that even in those that get infected uh, with COVID who've been vaccinated, right? So if you're vaccinated and you get infected, you have significant protection against long COVID. Part of the reason is probably that you and, and you also have significant protection against severe disease by right? being hospitalized. The reason you get sick is because the antibodies which circulate in the blood, uh, they're, they're all over the place, right? And, uh, but they 
their, their numbers fade out fairly quickly after the vaccination, even after two doses. And so some vaccines, like, you know, for example, hepatitis B, we have to give, uh, we give them one at one month, and then after, after a month, you give a second dose, and then after six months, you give a third dose. And that provides long-lasting protection, but those first two doses don't. So maybe this is going to be something similar. However, uh, there is a uh, there's a memory response that's retained, and so you you have memory B cells and memory T cells, two other arms of the immune system, that you know, they take a while to be they have to see the virus circulating, and then they'll initiate a response, and that response will likely protect you against long COVID and likely protect you against uh, severe disease. So uh, that, that's, you know, reasons to uh, continue to get vaccinated. And something, since we're talking about vaccines, we, we have to remember that something very interesting is that uh, coronaviruses in animals, for example, chickens, commercial chickens, they get two or three or four different coronavirus or vaccine shots in their two-year lifespan. So a commercial chicken might live two years, and they have this uh, coronavirus disease. It's not COVID; it's a different coronavirus, but that causes a severe bronchitis in poultry and is very infectious. And it's a threat to you know, commercial and non-commercial poultry farming. So, but they have to vaccinate these animals three or four times in a two-year lifespan. So, if you translate that, and similar things are true for other animal coronaviruses. In, in livestock. So we might have to think about the need to, uh, I mean, if we translate that to humans, well, we might need ongoing vaccination support for COVID uh, for a long time for the foreseeable future. Okay, I'm going to dig in because I think I was trying to give, give him questions that some of them he's already answered but that would be relevant towards our movement practice a little bit, but then I will leave some time also for us to be able to ask more questions. So if you have questions and you wanna stick them in the chat, uh, you're welcome to do that and I can ask them or I'll leave a little time at the end so that you guys can ask them too. What, what is the main thing that you think as movement specialists we could do to help people who have long COVID or help them with their impairments? What, what are some things that could be most helpful in your mind? I, I think just general, you know, mo mobility. I mean, moving, uh, it depends where their compromise is, right? So if they're uh, sort of a, a neurocognitive, if they're disoriented, then you'd approach them differently than if they had uh, terms of breath on exertion. So if they had uh, dyspnea or, or shortness of breath, then you would need to do uh, you know, appropriate exercises. You can't have them doing too many reps. You can't have them uh, doing other things. So you want to slowly, probably slowly build. I think the long COVID, you, you wouldn't, my approach is, is not unlike somebody with chronic fatigue syndrome or, uh, you know, a lot of, we, you know, a lot of viruses, can trigger, or other infections, or even stress, can trigger um, sort of uh, immune system dysfunction. And so perhaps that's what one of the things that's happening here. So uh, you guys probably see a lot of those, a lot of those patients, and you may need to uh, think about how you would uh, you know, approach those patients similar to how you would approach these patients. Certainly building stamina is, uh, is, is definitely uh, an, an important component. Okay, great. And then uh, about, we've also seen, well, I've seen, and I'm sure some of you, it sounds like I've seen neurological symptoms post COVID. Is there any rhyme or reason? I mean, we've talked about how it varies in different people but is there any rhyme or reason to the neurological symptoms that may come on or a consistency, or is it just kind of random at this stage or we don't have enough research to know at this point? Yeah, I mean, we, 
I, I don't I don't have a, a great sense. I haven't seen that many people with neurocognitive problems, uh, you know, myself to know, uh, you know, who's what what the risk factors were. And I, I don't know that we don't have a great way of predicting this. Uh, and I think and that's that's again an argument for optimal state of health to, to begin with. But people with uh, you know pre-existing conditions certainly you know, if somebody already has uh, some neurocognitive issues and they get COVID, you might expect those uh, to get worse or the cognitive function to decline uh, after they get COVID. That's that happens a lot with any illness. And how long will they take to recover, or will they not? We, what, what we're thinking. A lot of us are that it's going to be really hard to get people back to their baseline. And right? once they have long COVID, uh, or once they have COVID, uh, it's it's going to be really hard to get people back to their pre-op baseline. If you look at the the, the sort of case descriptions uh, on the USA rowing team back uh, last summer, I think, or or spring, a lot of uh, before, not, not this past summer, in summer of 2020, or spring 2020, a lot of the USA rowing, uh, women's rowing team members got infected. And they had a really, really hard time getting back to their pre-COVID baseline in terms of physical fitness. So uh, yeah, we're seeing this in top athletes, we're seeing this in the rest of us who are just you know, normal people too. and. Uh, we can you know, to struggle to get back to your baseline, which is another argument for masking, preventing infection. Uh, Nahid asked the question uh, for people who have had long COVID pre vaccination and are now vaccinated. Uh, have I seen them regress if they get, a, get COVID a second time? You know, the person that's had COVID and has had a vaccine is the person that has the most protection. So I haven't seen any of those get COVID a second time. Not to say it's impossible, but you know that's the best antibody protection you can have. If you've had COVID and had the vaccine, uh, your your protection is is top notch. I would much rather have the vaccine than have COVID. Then you, your protection is also better, but you know that you already have protection against long COVID. And did the rowing team ever get back to baseline? I think a lot of the women did. I didn't follow the story to the end, uh, so I'm not. I'm not certain. I knew that they were having a hard time. If I can jump in with a follow up question, um, so I I had long COVID and I consider myself um, basically mostly recovered. I mean, not quite a baseline, but I basically recovered a ton. Um, but I do see other people in the quote, long COVID community who do recover for a number of months and then they suddenly get worse again. And um, sometimes they think, did I catch COVID again? But they don't seem to test positive. Sometimes they think, oh, maybe I exerted myself. Um, and so I have a bit of a fear of regression. So I'm wondering if you've seen what are the kinds of things that could cause a setback after you've thought, thought you've recovered. Right. Uh, that, that's a good question. I, I, uh, yeah, I don't know to, uh, to be honest. But what might uh, do that? I have a lot of patients that um, you know they have symptoms that wax and wane, and they get they get better. And similar to to what you were saying, some some patients who have relapsed symptoms after getting better, they come and see me, and in my functional medicine practice and. I've, uh, yeah, I, I do my best to help them. Sometimes it's, uh, you can, uh, they have a more dysfunctional people reaction to stress. So uh, and other, other stressors, uh, and too much stress at work, uh, a car accident, death of a loved one, that will, uh, that now all of a sudden they are more physically sensitive to stress than they were before the long COVID. So we see this with chronic Lyme uh, and uh, you know, other uh, other infections, some people with 
kind of fatigue too. They they get better and then they there's a stressful occurrence and then they have a relapse. We try to minimize those relapses in, in terms of severity and duration so that uh, you know but just by supportive care therapy um, um supplements and uh, you know there, there's another hypothesis there's several hypotheses about long covid one is is it persistent infection and there's probably a small portion or a portion of long covid patients or sufferers that do have persistent lingering infection and there's been a few uh, reports where culturable virus right i don't really consider viruses live they're they're dependent parasites they, they depend on they don't have their own cellular machinery to reproduce they depend on your cell to reproduce so uh but you know there have been uh sort of autopsy uh studies where somebody's died for a reason and they have had covid or they had long COVID symptoms, and you know, more than a month later or three months later, they discover a quote unquote live virus in the splenic biopsy, for example. That that's not that's probably not the most common cause, but probably it's immune uh, dysregulation. The immune system is become imbalanced. It doesn't know how to tame uh, the uh, inflammation that COVID has caused. It, COVID kills people basically by uh, launching a severe or, or uh, inflammatory reaction. And so some of the newer treatments that we're giving in, uh, in for hospitalized COVID patients have to do with, you know, some of them are steroids, but uh, others are medications for in severe inflammation, for example, medications that you might use for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, severe injections or uh, some pills that you might use for certain cancers. We're using those to suppress inflammation so that the patients can get better. And I wanna to add to that just from a physical perspective as well. I think um, even though a lot of people are re recovered it takes, I mean, if you think about back to that rowing team, those are highly trained, like the most highly trained athlete really that you can be And rowing. I would put way at the top, right? That's complete physical exertion, all your muscles and your cardiovascular system. Uh, if it's taking them a really long time to get back to baseline. And even if you're a really fit, healthy person, I think uh, it just takes so long and so much more. And so what I've been seeing and maybe Andy, you can say if you've seen this too, but is that it? The, there's a fatigue, a certain amount of fatigue that lingers uh, for a longer period of time that you maybe don't realize in your everyday life. So it's when people who have had COVID go out to try and do a sport again, or they start to up their activity level back to more recreational sports or more, like maybe they're starting to come to Pilates class every day of the week like before, but all of a sudden they're having more symptoms or more fatigue and that that's lingering. And I think when the body's still fatigued, you're just more susceptible to other things as well. So, um, you know, maybe that is part of it as well. And then also uh, another sort of question is, um, I actually had COVID as well. And the thing that happens, I couldn't get my B12 back, I couldn't get my blood cell numbers right for a really long time, it seemed like afterwards. And I think that it, I think there's probably a lot of times where those things are not just right. And those those are a lot of things that also create more fatigue over time. So I don't know if that was a unique case, but I would think that that may be happening to other people as well. Uh, absolutely. I, and I, one thing I would add is that I don't consider you know, Olympic athletes, uh, rowing athletes to be, I don't consider that healthy, not from a functional medicine standpoint, they're extreme. You know, anything on the extreme mm -hmm. is, is not healthy. I, I met a, a trainer for one of the Tour de France teams in San Diego a couple of years ago, and they were talking about functional medicine and that, he said, oh yeah, these guys are in, in terrible health overall, right? I mean, they're, they're strong, they can ride a bike, but, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's not healthy. It's not, um, they don't necessarily live longer than 
the person who does moderate exercise, right? It's not necessarily healthy. Uh, and maybe that is in part why a lot of them uh, were suffering, but you know, they, were, they are otherwise, they don't have any medical diagnoses, but just to say that, you know, what is health, health is a balance and, uh, you know, extremes of uh, work, stress, exercise, even if it's, a, a, you know, extreme, extremes of any type of food also are um, not necessarily healthy, right? So uh, we, we just have to think about, put that into perspective. And um, the, 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 at first, before we had vaccines, the best defense against COVID was uh, vitamin D, we think, but sleep uh, and, you know, balance, uh, with, with controlling stress, that's what we were advising our patients, but we didn't have anything else uh, to give them. Um, so another question that comes up and that I'm actually getting from clients is, what about the flu this year? Do we think we need to also get vaccinated? The flu vaccine, is that a good idea? Is that too much on my system? I'm getting that question from some of my clients as well at this point. Yeah, I mean, always be careful with answering those uh, even when you're not the patient's doctor. So I have to also be careful because I'm not their doctor. But in general, uh, the the um, uh, CDC came out with a guidance, with guidance that said you can give flu and COVID vaccines at the same time now. So there's no there's not even a need to wait. Uh, we do have, we did have data early on in the pandemic from Brazil that showed that, and, and another study more recently that, that showed that flu uh, vaccine protects against uh, people who had the flu vaccine that get COVID have better outcomes than people who have not had the flu vaccine. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe we've revved up their immune system just a little bit with the flu vaccine. Is there some overlap? I doubt it. They're completely different viruses, but uh, we, we don't understand why. But uh, the the recommendations to get your flu shot, and I will get my flu shot before November first uh, this year. As uh, I have to, I don't. Last year we didn't see any flu really. I mean, it was impressive because of masking. But now people are becoming lax with masking, and we've seen. I don't know if you guys have heard of a virus called respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. It's a common cause of the cold in adults, but it can kill, uh, it's dangerous for young children and infants. And uh, there's been a surprising sort of late summer, early fall surge of RSV nationwide. And uh, at my kid's school, everybody, every kid was, was sick with a, a bad cold and they all got COVID tested. Uh, and nobody had COVID, uh, you know, runny nose, sore throat, cough, etc. So the standard things that we would take for granted at school, in you know, two years ago. But you know, now we all freak out. Oh, it's COVID, but it was it, it was unfortunately. But uh, we are probably going to see more flu this year than we did last year. So I'm getting a flu shot. I'm recommending flu shots. But if you've had them in the past and you have no problem with them, then you should get them. So the other question we often get uh, now in California, I will speak to California, and maybe in, if anybody wants to speak to another area, is we are still at the point where we're supposed to be masking indoors, but they're not requiring vaccinations to go indoors necessarily. Um, in Switzerland, you are not allowed to go indoors to do anything without a vaccination. Um, and I think in other places in Europe are like that as well. Um, so I, I'm curious if you think that that, you know, there's a lot of controversy over the masking indoors. And at some point that's going to be lifted. And in a Pilates studio where people, most of our clients really want to take their masks off and they're, some of them, are, they're holding out. But, but how safe is that really? I mean, we do have windows open, we have filters going. How, what would you, you know, even if the numbers go down, is that really a good idea? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's all about ventilation and um, air circulation. We, 
the Delta variant, which is the predominant strain in worldwide now, especially in the US, you know, is mainly airborne transmission. What does that mean? That means that uh, ventilation is even more important. I mean, that's a practical consideration. And masking does help. So uh, the uh, you know, so distancing indoors with very good indoor ventilation could be an option to keep the spread down. And requiring, it used to be, I mean, before Delta, people were getting vaccinated and didn't, they, they weren't having any virus if they got infected. So now even vaccinated people will have the same viral load if they get infected as unvaccinated people. So that's why the booster dose may be important. Uh, and, uh, but they are, they shed virus for much less time. They don't shed virus for as long of a time span. The, the, um, the windows open, and I know the studio super well, uh, windows open uh, with those uh, HEPA filters going will help significantly. And, you know, also a little bit of distance between clients would help, but that's not always practical. And then you have the therapist working with the client, so there's no distance there. Yeah, I require I all my clients to get, I require all my clients to get tested. I require all of them to wear a mask. So if they have a problem with it, with them too bad, because I'm not going to risk my other client's safety. I'm not going to risk my safety, you know, um, it, there is the potential to carry the disease if you have your two vaccinations. I don't know what the statistics are on the third, on the booster, whether you can still carry and spread, you know, with that, with the booster. I don't know what, how that it's is. Probably, it's probably a lot less. We don't know all the, the, right. the, the nuances, so, but it's probably a lot less. For the sake of my clients who cannot afford to get ill for various reasons, and myself, I have an autoimmune disorder. Um, my studio is in my home, but I, you know, I, I fired clients before because they refused to get tested and I'm sorry, but I cannot live in a world with people who are not team players. And if I have to go broke, then that's fine, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to train someone who is not going to agree to be tested. You know, especially if they're high, especially if they're high risk, you know, like a teacher, you know, teachers yeah. are high risk, yeah. um, you know, and I just think that like you all got COVID. I don't even see how you guys got COVID during the health industry. You should know better, you know, and you should take the precautions. I'm not sure how that happened, but me, luckily we have, you know, we've, we all people around us are falling around dead and all kinds of stuff. And we've managed to play it safe because we have worn masks. And that's just the final word, I think. Okay. There's another question from Nahid here about um, monoclonal antibodies. Do you think that that could help with long COVID? It depends on the etiology and the, the, the reason why they have the symptoms. Is it immune dysfunction or not? We know that uh, the monoclonal antibodies, we know they help early on after infection. So uh, before they require oxygen, so before they need to be in the hospital, that's when they help. Do they help afterwards? I haven't seen any data. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, they're being given, uh, they're, they're being paid for by the US government. So uh, there's no charge to give them, but they're, they're infusions. You have to have a place to get the infusion. Uh, et cetera, and they have to be specially compounded or, or mixed. So uh, it's, it's a comp com administration of those medications is complicated. And I don't know, there may be some studies with long COVID uh, going on in another way. Thank you for that. And actually, going back to your previous um, answer when I asked about why people might have relapses. And you said we can be more physically sensitive to stress than before long COVID. Can you explain that mechanism? Like what is it about stress that can, you know, and, and people who've had long COVID or Lyme where 
yeah, I think the, the mechanism is inflammation, uh, you know, stress. Um, yeah, stress can cause inflammation. Just that we, we know that decreasing stress decreases inflammation. Uh, you know, there are studies on, for example, meditation and blood pressure, uh, or even cytokine levels. And you can you can do post pre and post meditation uh, levels of inflammatory markers in the blood, and and they're decreased. The opposite is true wow. as well. So so we know that increased stress, and I don't know why people get more sensitive to stress. Yes. You know, I one I was talk about uh, you know. You know, people, I, I, I use this for my patients. So I, I say, you know, maybe we have sort of this much energy for a day, right? Yeah, this much energy for a day. And then, but if you're using this much energy, uh, two pencils worth of energy here in one day, all right, what are you doing? You're borrowing from tomorrow. So you're, you're depleting yourself. So most of us will have to pay the price at some point, right? At some point, we will... Uh, you know, reach an inflection point, and then we'll we'll have some kind of symptom. Whether it's some people, it's reflux, palpitation. I have palpitations. I have uh, sensitivity to mold. I have all kinds of uh, you know stuff going on once I, I reach that inflection point, and that's what happens with a lot of my patients. And then if you get an illness on top of it, that you know it can make that inflection point a little bit lower. So that you'll reach that infection point earlier. And so once you've reached it, you're, you're in a situation where you have to really regulate uh, your, your stress. So what you do, uh, you know, how much stress you have, you have to have, uh, you have to be super conscious of having a balanced life. And a lot of my patients with chronic illness of any, any kind, you know, that's what, that's where we end up. And some, some patients, it takes them a few years to get there and to realize that, yes, I need to focus on me and my nervous system because the, uh, you know, the, the, the classic thing is, your dog, give me a pill, make me better. And so I can keep doing the, I can keep overdoing what I've been doing, you know, my whole life. And that's not going to, I mean, sure, I give people things that it'll help their symptoms, they'll feel better. But and sometimes there's a quick fix, but usually it's, now let's work, decrease stress, decrease the number of things on your plate and uh, have a balanced life, you know, have fun, have, uh, but, but work on the nervous system and work on the physical system, it's connected. So, uh, you know, in a lot of those people, they, they may have, uh, you, know, you know, obviously they have physical manifestations taking it back to what you, you all do and, and you really have to <clears throat> combine the reality and address the physical uh, uh, manifestation. So, and that might be, uh, you know, more gentle stretching, more gentle exercises, more, um, you know, you know not, might not be. I had one patient with long COVID who uh, goes to a uh, physical therapist in Northern California, and uh, you know, was saying that it just wasn't working because the, that PT just, you know, exercise, 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 and um, trying to, to just build up blindly and uh, the, the stamina, but that, that doesn't work. You need to be. Uh, really evaluate where the patient is and work more holistically on, on what's going on. And so you might do some maneuvers or manual activities to uh, loosen them up a little bit and or, or a little bit of uh, obviously movement just to keep their range of motion active and not worry about strengthening, just worry about maintain, maintenance and range of motion. And rather than more intense. I think that 
I think breath patterns are very important because I have a client who had COVID and when I have her do proper breathing, she actually starts to cough because there's probably something still in her lungs that has not, that has not gotten itself out. And as far as the reason I read that the reason that sometimes you can get the, the symptoms again, even if you don't test positive, it has to do with the immunoglobins, immunoglobin A, G, T, H, I think I forget which ones they are. So they stay in your body body and they hide out. And then um, at any point they can come out because they are there to protect the body. So they've kind of like taken on the form. They, they've held on to the virus um, as a form of protection. And then they, I don't know, it has to do with the immunoglobins. The immunoglobins. Uh, well, 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 you have specific immunoglobulins that, you know, that, that uh, again, as I was mentioning, they, they, Immunoglobulin G, for example, it, it decreases over time after infection. And uh, same with IgA, uh, immunoglobulin A. And uh, those, uh, you know, that, that's what we follow for, uh, you know, to do a COVID antibody test to see if you had COVID or a different antibody assay called the spike protein assay. You do that to see if you still have a vaccine response that's specific to. Uh, the vaccine response. So, uh, you know, you can do those assays, but those those antibody levels drop over time. But uh, you are right in the sense that when you have a stressful insult, you might have a, um, a release of inflammatory mediators. Uh, and you sometimes we see, for example, with, with patients with a, a stress response, we'll see high titers to Epstein-Barr virus. And uh, I was telling my patient, well, that could, that, that might mean that you have chronic active Epstein Barr infection or chronic active mono. But in most cases, it, it's probably true that they just have inflammation and the body is, you know, that's a virus that stays sort of dormant in people, unlike COVID. Um, for, for most people, Epstein Barr can stay dormant in, in people and be reactivated if you have a transplant or something of other issues, but uh, you can see the antibody uh, levels change with the levels of inflammation. So it's a very sort of anecdotal experience on my part, but uh, but there, there is some something there in, in you know, your, uh, your, your immune response has changed uh, perhaps after COVID, after chronic Lyme, after, uh, some other infection, and and uh, maybe it has to do with you know somebody who uh, is is not depleted has a balanced life. Maybe they have less of a uh, an issue, but there's also a genetic predisposition. So some people just on, the, on their genetics, they're going to have uh, a different outcome than than others. There's a comment here. I just wanted to make sure everybody saw. Um, Nancy Hayes was saying um, that she thinks one of the keys for us as Pilates instructors is to focus on movement and breath patterns, which I think is kind of what we're discussing here. Um, she's found lighter springs, slower pace to help clients reconnect with their bodies and create that synergy of mind, body, and spirit so they can make progress toward full recovery. And I think that's also, I would have to concur with that. It sounds like um, a lot of uh, Melinda, I think it sounds like you were saying about the same thing, that breath really matters. And I think that that's been the experience. All, and I would add to that, it's it's all it's that exchange of air, but it's also if somebody's had, and maybe Ramsey, you could speak to this too, but if somebody's had a lung disease of any kind, which COVID tends to be a respiratory for many people, um, there is always, there could be potentially some scarring. There could be uh, not only in the lungs themselves, but also the ribs are really affected and the movement of the ribs could be guarded or protected, or there could be spasming around that area. So just the idea of taking in that full breath and allowing the ribs to expand and contract again. Um, I've put people in all kinds of like a little bit of a side bend and then ha just having them hold and expand and contract again, um, holding um, just with the push through bar and cats breathing, for example, um, that seems to really 
move the rib cage and gets creates more mobility. Uh, a few of my clients have really stiff thoracic areas. So that's after COVID. Um, so that's been something that I've worked a lot of swans and um, cat swans, all the things, shoulder movement, lap movement, all those things that can just get that upper open a little bit seems to be helping somewhat. And it sounds like, so I think that goes right hand in hand with the breathing. Yeah. I physically stretch my clients who've had COVID so that they will um, stretch the, the fascia of the thoracic spine mm -hmm. and be able to, um, you know, breathe correctly again. I, I physically stretch them because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's hard to get that deep, deep stretch. And I really feel that that's been a big key in like my clients who had COVID. And I think that that could be very helpful. And just to show you some images so of, of what, so normally this is a CAT scan uh, of uh, the chest with the cut sort of at the uh, top part of the heart, it looks like, and this slice, it's just a slice in the chest, but the, the lungs are black. Uh, this is all normal here, this is the heart. What's not, uh, these are some blood vessels, that's normal. This is kind of normal, um, don't, don't worry about that, but most of this should be black. You can see some of these are uh, the bronchioles, the breathing tubes on end. But what you see here, this is not normal at all. It should, should be more like this, uh, this kind of pattern, this dark darkness. And over here, this is scarring from COVID. So once you've had COVID pneumonia, uh, you know, you're going to have lung damage. These, these, these findings on, on the CAT scan are, um, you know, and it, it shows um, significant inflammation and that's going to lead to scarring. So I like the idea of stretching the thoracic cavity, getting lung expansion going. Um, they, they have taken a hit and, and working with them gently, lighter springs, love that. Uh, it's not, we have to get out of our go, 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 more is better mentality with these people. Uh, and, you know, this is sort of the slow and steady, uh, yeah, uh, slow and steady wins the race, I should say. I just wanted to jump in real quick and say, I've had some success using visual and vestibular drills um, to help people achieve when, when there's that locking up, especially of the thoracic spine and just getting them to do some convergence drills or smooth pursuits or things that don't seem like exercise. <clears throat> so you might think about that because what I'm noticing um, off of your presentation today is that there's a lot of like autonomic symptoms, uh, heart rate, breath rate, inflammation, all of these things. And so finding ways to really stimulate uh, brainstem response, not just gives us better movement throughout the spinal cord. Um, but I've had pretty, pretty good success just using um, very basic visual drills before putting somebody into a specific movement pattern or stretch. Um, and I've even assessed, you know, their ability to do a movement pattern or stretch, given them a visual drill, and then have a little bit more of that unlocking and uh, ease of movement without feeling that stiffness or pain response. So I'm kind of um, starting to think in my head as you're talking that maybe those drills might be good for specifically long COVID patients as well, if those are the types of symptoms that we're seeing. I, I love that. That's awesome. That's fantastic. That's exactly what you should be doing. Great. So we're, we've kind of come to the end. I know a few people had to pop off already to go get to their next client. Um, if you guys have more questions and you want to send them, you can send them to the Facebook page or you can send them directly to my email and I'll make sure that we get an answer for you. And I just wanted to share one, one more thing at, at CCFM which is the functional medicine practice where, where I work. We have a whole list of COVID resources about long COVID and we have uh, COVID support groups, uh, et cetera. So uh, you can refer patients to see me through there or uh, just refer them for some resources. Or look at both yourself. All right, Thank thanks you guys. Hopefully we'll see you again at another, we have expert rounds every first Thursday of the month where we try and bring in an expert and the rest of the month, always at this time and the same link. 
we're studying, we're pulling up case studies. I always present a case study and um, sometimes people offer their case study and we discuss through it and work on best patient practices, um, share ideas. So if you ever have a difficult case or you wanna powwow about it, come on in, bring it on. Um, if you just wanna listen to what other people are working on, we'd love to have you. And then the first Thursday of every month, we're posting what is coming up for the next month for the expert rounds, the first Thursday of the month. So. Thanks again, you guys, and hope to see you again.